now we are recording. I'm just going to put myself on mute for one second. Um, so I think my dog's about to go crazy. <laughs> All right, thanks for waiting, everyone. So for ECO 201 students, you actually don't have any new work to do today. Uh, we actually are just gonna cover the differences in the rubrics and answer any lingering questions you might have. So if you've done all your milestones, you are pretty much uh, done. And all you have to do at this point is revise. You're not adding any more new content. So let's pull up the final project. Um, the rubric so we can go through that. Bear with me while I find the right file. And this is the one. And it is. Okay. So um, as you know, you've got your three, you've got your three milestones already submitted. Hopefully um, all three of them have been submitted. And they pretty much follow the exact order of your final paper. Uh, so milestone one, um, this is the, the final paper altogether, was section num Roman numeral one that you see here. And then and milestone two covered numerals two and three, those sections. And then the last milestone covered the remaining three sections, four, five, and six. Um, so you're gonna combine those into one document and then go through if they're not already in one document. I know some students kept it all together, which is fine too. So you're gonna go, once you've done that, you're gonna go through your feedback and take a look at the final project rubric um, and see what improvements you can make based on those two things. So I'm gonna scroll down to that. Okay, thanks, Ellen. Yeah, so this is um, for microeconomics. This is a quick reminder. So you'll see here that, and we've talked about this in some, some of the other webinars if you attended or watched the recordings, but you'll notice that um, all of your milestone grading, there were just three performance levels in terms of um, the grading uh, for each of the critical elements. So it was not evident if you missed that section, needs improvement, um, if you didn't quite hit the mark, and then proficient um, was the highest score, it was a perfect score on the milestone. But here you'll notice that now the values have shifted and we've added the exemplary column. So, so this is just taking things a little bit beyond proficient. So it's usually just adding uh, a little bit more detail, um, maybe more examples. Uh, it's a little different for each one, so it's not standard through each of them. They each have their own descriptor for what exemplary is. But that's the general gist of it, that you do something above and beyond just the proficient level. So one of the ways that this course was designed was to say, okay, you've got your milestones um, and we're gonna grade those a little less stringently that we're gonna grade the final um, because you're gonna have more time, you're gonna have the whole class behind you by this point pretty much, and you're gonna have the benefit of your instructor's feedback. So now you're able to reach, you're, you're more able to reach that exemplary level instead of expecting that level of performance on your milestone. So the milestone is more of what we call a formative assessment where you're working things out still. Um, and now this is your summative assessment, your final assessment where you should have it all worked out um, and put those finishing touches on things. So like I said, a lot of them are just about adding more detail or more concrete examples. But there are a few that I want to look at in particular because most students do need to go back and touch them up. Um, from the milestone to the final because there are things that you most likely weren't in a position to do at the exemplary level, um, even at the milestone level. Now, for some of you, you might already have hit the exemplary level. You did a fantastic job on your milestones. So some of these you might look at and say, look, I think I'm already there. I got good feedback from my instructor. They didn't see any need for improvement. I'm reading the description and I think I'm there. That's very much possible for a lot of these elements. So I'm just going to focus on the ones that most typically need uh, that most typically need some attention um, in this revision process. So the first one is actually the introduction. So the introduction, I know for a lot of you, it felt it felt odd. 
you're talking about uh, you're giving an introduction to your paper when your paper isn't finished yet. Uh, so that that can be a little bit of a challenge. So because of that, you were advised uh, to keep it a little bit vague and come back and add the detail later. So you'll notice that for proficient, it just says outlines the purpose of the paper and how it will inform the conclusion. So how it will inform the conclusion, that part was going to be a little bit vague. Um, you're just using the general ways that it's going to inform your conclusion based on the prompt. You know, you're going to look at all these different microeconomic um, concepts, use, use those microeconomic concepts, apply them to your firm and the market that your firm is in um, to make some conclusions about how they can stay profitable. That's the purpose of your paper. Um, but, you know, that's very generic. Uh, and at the beginning in week two, that was totally acceptable to get a proficient. But if you want to move to the exemplary level, you're going to want to add some more detail in there. So, so as you add in that detail about exactly how, you know, what is your conclusion going to be? Are you, you're talking about them being more profitable by doing what? Um, so, you know, all of your analysis has given you an insight into what that will look like. And now you can come back and give some of those hints here in the introduction. And then the rest of your paper spells it all out and you've got your conclusion at the end. So this is kind of like a preview of your conclusion. Um, much briefer than that. So if you see exemplary, it says meets proficient criteria and uses industry specific language to establish expertise. So you're adding that stuff that's specific to your firm and your firm's industry when you're talking about the purpose of your paper and how it's going to inform your conclusions. So most cases you might not have been able to do that at the beginning. You didn't have that that expertise in the industry because you hadn't done all the research yet. Now you have. Now you can go add it back in. Uh, so I see a couple questions, uh, so I'll address those since we do have um, have some time here. So Matt uh, Matthew Farmer asks, if they said they do not see anything that needs changes, um, would that be considered exemplary? Um, Matthew, that that is uh, that is what I would take away from that. Uh, I would still advise you to check out the descriptor for exemplary and and make sure for yourself. Um, we are trying to make sure that. All instructors are sending a consistent message to students um, when they say that it doesn't need any improvements, that um, they're also remembering exactly what the expectations are here in exemplary. So chances are that that is exactly the message that they were sending you. But um, I don't want to leave any stone unturned or advise you to leave any stone unturned. So it's always good to do your due diligence and just read through this and, and see how it matches up. All right, so Hillary asks uh, if a uh, same question. Okay, so hopefully I address that. Um, again, it, it's it's good sense to just come here and check if you did get perfect scores um, and you said, you know, the feedback was just, hey, you know, excellent work, no changes need to be made. Um, but this way you can just a brief check, make sure that it matches up with what you've done. And then, and maybe you find something you do want to add um, just to be sure, but, you know, always, always good to, to cover those bases. So that's the introduction and the purpose. Um, that one, most students have to come back and at least tweak a little bit. The next one where we see that happening a lot is, I'm going to scroll down to the next page, is in the price elasticity section. So in this section, um, one that tends to be pretty straightforward for students to tackle is uh, the second price elasticity of demand element, consumer responsiveness. So you'll notice that for proficient, it says it ex it you explain the factors that affect consumer responsiveness to price changes using the concept of price elasticity as a guide. So we know that there's these um, different factors of price elasticity of demand. Our book outlines five of them. Um, I've actually seen other texts and other ins you know institutions include more, but we tend to stick with the five that are in our textbook. Um, so for exemplary, you need to review all five of those factors. Maybe for proficient, you reviewed one, two, three of them that were to you the most important. Um, but to get exemplary, just make sure to cover the other ones. Um, so that's usually something students can easily add in. Um, and you can make sure that you do that adjustment and get that credit. So no, um, an abstract is is not uh, is not a must because it's not in the rubric. But um, because it's part of APA in general, 
and our our citations and our formatting, like uh, the fonts and the margin spaces, are all meant to be in APA format. Um, some instructors do expect it, but you're not graded on the the content of your abstract. Um, there's nowhere in the rubric. All right, so that's the price elasticity one um, that is usually pretty easy for students to add on to. You notice a lot of these are. Um, you know, price elasticity, pricing decisions, using research to illustrate your claims. The next one, um, profitability, concrete examples to substantiate your claims. So a lot of them are just like that. So you might have gone over something with the microeconomic theory, you know, about um, looking at revenue and cost and how that relates to profit, for example, in this one. Um, but then to take it to that next level, you can add some very specific examples um, to back up the claims that you're making about profitability, for instance. So you'll, you'll see that throughout a lot of them. Uh, another one that it's easy to just go ahead if you haven't done it already and add something in is on the market share. So if you'll read overall market market share, you'll see that the proficient example says discusses the market share of the firm and its top competitors by providing details on current percentages for each firm and describing the trend over time. Now, most people tend to do a pretty good job on this one, but you'll notice that for exemplary, it asks you to present the data graphically and over time. So if you just happen to not have it in a graph, and most students do because, you know, it makes sense to put that kind of thing in a pie chart or the information where you got it already has it in some sort of chart, usually a pie chart um, or even a bar graph. But if you don't have it, it's a, just a very easy switch to make. You've presented the data already, and now it's just asking you to present it graphically. So that's um, the, the low hanging fruit, as we like to call it. Uh, the next one, and this one, I think a lot of people struggle with on the milestone um, because there's just so much to cover. So this is an easy one for students to miss, um, but the barriers to entry to get exemplary, usually students, once they attempt it, they have a pretty easy go of it. So um, this one is worth taking a look and making sure that you've addressed it. And if you haven't, it should be pretty easy to do. So if we read the proficient, it says, analyze the barriers to entry in this market to illustrate the potential for new competition and its impact on the firm's future in the market. So you know, you've talked about how easy or difficult it might be for new firms to enter and give your firm a run for their money, what does that mean for your firm? So if you know, let, you've done a great job talking about that, let's say. But to get exemplary, it asks you to provide specific examples um, of successful and or failed entrance into the market. So let's say you know, you're talking about, um, a good example I give is, uh, is Starbucks. Um, so students who do Starbucks you know, can talk about coffee chains that are trying to break into the market. So for instance, McDonald's is making a big run at, uh, you know, better coffee. It used to be they didn't advertise their coffee really at all, even though they've always sold it. Um, they've been selling it ever since I've known McDonald's as a kid, but they didn't try to make it, you know, an attraction that you would go to McDonald's just for their coffee. And they've definitely been upping that lately and trying to make, um, you know, more gourmet type coffees. So that would be an example. Um, there's there's lots of other examples, and some you might have have failed ones that you talk, you know this this firm tried to get in and they just they couldn't make a go of it. Uh, so that will either support you say you know this this firm uh, this um this industry had high barriers to entry and see this firm tried to get in and it couldn't, or this for, this uh, this industry had high barriers to entry but this firm was able to overcome them by doing X Y and Z. So, you, know, you can just tell the story uh, of these successful and failed entrants and how that relates to the barriers to entry and, and how it impacts your firm. But most everyone is able to find an example and move from that proficient level to the exemplary level. And it's something that often students leave out in their milestone. So it's good to remind yourself to go back and add that. And then um, the recommendations, usually students do pretty well on these. Um, my suggestion on the recommendations bit is just make sure that everything has been tied back to stuff that you've talked about in the paper before. So if you want to make a great recommendation about a new product or service that your firm 
um, should should sell, then if you haven't include if you haven't alluded to that somewhere in your paper, um, you might want to go back and see if you need to add something or make sure that your recommendations align with the analysis that you've done and maybe you might need to change a recommendation um, because all of that is going to be looking for you to to make those connections and make sure that that they're based on the work that you've done and not just you know randomly pulled out even though they're great ideas so if i wanted to talk about let's say i was doing doing my paper on you know the hershey example if i wanted to say that they should start selling more um more candy and less chocolate. I would have to have a reason for saying that. You know, it could be something based on cost. The cost of cocoa is going up, but the cost of sugar is going down. So they should pivot more towards candies instead of chocolates. You know, that that would be a reason. Um, but if the reason was people just start liking candy more and people aren't liking chocolate as much for whatever reason, uh, I'm a chocolate eater, so I wouldn't ever feel that way. But if that were the trend that you observed and, and had evidence to prove from your earlier section on demand trends, um, then that would make sense here to include that, uh, that suggested action. So just make sure that those things are lined up and then you explain them well um, and that you're making those connections clear. And you can you know, refer back to the work that you've done um, as you make those connections. So Carol asks, would you give an example of use rubric language? Um, I've seen a couple instructors announcements encouraging that this be done for our final submissions. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, Carol. So I want to make sure I answer your question correctly. Do you mean that the, your instructor is looking for you to, to use similar language to what the rubric has? Is that, is that what you've been advised to do? Okay, um, if they're telling you to actually use the language from the rubric, um, it, it might be something as simple, you know, if it talks about, let me find a, an easy to illustrate example here. Um, you know, this one talks about conditions impact, uh, talks about if effectively evaluates trends and demand. So you could say, talk about the trends and demand. Um, and come out and say, you know, the trends and demand in this industry have been, and you know, list some of the trends that you see. Um, I'm trying to think if there's some other, you know, price elastic. This one talks a lot about price elasticity. Uh, all three of them do. So you'll be, you know, using that the, that terminology. Um, it sounds, I that seems a little bit too simplistic. I hope I'm not. I hope I'm getting to the heart of your question. It's hard without reading what what you read, what your instructor shared with you. So yeah, the industry specific language that Adam mentions is a, is a little different. So, um, you know, if you're writing a paper about Starbucks, I expect in your introduction to hear things about um, store locations and coffee and, um, you know, maybe different kinds of coffees and food products and uh, maybe even benefits to workers and, and things like that, things that have to do with that industry. Um, you know, maybe minimum wage, any, anything that's relevant to that industry. Those things wouldn't be meaningful at all if you're writing your paper about General Motors, in which case you'd want to talk about, um, you know, factories where they're building the cars. You talk about steel, you talk about um, different kinds of vehicles, hybrids, you know, things like those are the, the kinds of terms I would expect to hear if you're writing about GM. So Carol, let me take a look. So use the highlighted wording from the rubric that the wording is echoed in our paper. Um, perhaps it's hard for me to see which words are highlighted here. Um, do they mean no? Do you mean the rubric? So not not these highlighted words because um, these words are highlighted, but this just maps to the name of the critical element. So, you know, if they, they could be referring to, like, for instance, this one, price elasticity of demand consumer responsiveness. Now, me personally, I wouldn't be necessarily looking for you to say consumer responsiveness. You might say price elasticity 
demand instead. Um, but were they looking for you to include headers or just to use the language in your writing? Like paragraph, like headers for each section. So before you start the section on supply and demand, for instance, do they are they talking about you including the header that's from the rubric, maybe? Okay, so that's yeah. I'm 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 pretty sure it's it's probably generic, like what, what I said at the beginning, just like what Ellen says to use that economic terminology, which is found here in the rubric. Um, so things like you know price elasticity of demand, demand trends, um, market share, barriers to entry, um, all these things that you see repeated here throughout the the rubric elements using using those economic terms. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing if they were calling it the rubric language. It's it's in the rubric because they're economic terms, which is why we want that you to use them so that you're using the economic terminology. Um, but yes, very very, and that would be important in other courses too. They want you to use the discipline specific terminology, whether it's an economics course or a history course. That's going to be expected, and the rubric would most likely include that language no matter what class you're in. So those are the main um, the main questions I have. Does anybody have any any questions about general feedback they've received or um, any particular critical elements that I didn't cover? I covered the ones where I think students tend to not already be at exemplary, and it's pretty easy jump to get there. Um, that way you know exactly what to do. But if you have one in particular that's kind of chewing away inside your mind, then feel free to bring it up. Otherwise, we can just talk about Game of Thrones. <laughs> I finally caught up. So it doesn't look like anybody has any more questions and doesn't look like anybody watches Game of Thrones, just me. <laughs> no, I know you all love it. <laughs> of course, I'm sure there's like an economics paper in Game of Thrones somewhere. <laughs> I personally like to base my economic comparisons to The Walking Dead, but The Walking Dead's not on right now. So. <laughs> No, I won't I won't make any spoilers. Don't anyone else. <laughs> yeah, The Walking Dead. It's that's a good one. I can't wait for it to come back. But um all I can say is, you know, from here on out, not about not about the Walking Dead or Game of Thrones, but just to, to really take a fine tooth comb to your feedback. Anywhere where you got needs improvement, you should have some fairly detailed feedback. Uh if you got needs improvement on any of the critical elements from your milestones, read it like tonight if you have time. Just you know, so you don't lose lose it, and then you know, all all of a sudden it's Saturday and you don't have time to talk to your instructor. But if you go through and read that through that tonight or tomorrow, um, and if there's any feedback you don't understand and you're not like, okay, this is I know what I need to do. Doesn't mean you have to do it tonight to take action on it tonight, but you know what you need to do. I would go through that, and if you don't know what you need to do based on that feedback, email your instructor. They'll be happy to explain. Maybe they just need a couple more sentences to clarify what they were thinking and let you know, okay, this is kind of the direction I'm trying to, I'm trying to send you, and then you'll be in a much better position. So the sooner you get through that process and understand, okay, I know what I need to do here or I don't know what I need to do here, then the more time you're going to have to go to your instructor and get your answer back because if you leave it till Saturday or Sunday um, they might not get back to you in time and I don't want any of you to be in that position yeah well TV <laughs> it's my guilty pleasure watching TV so yes 
Although, Ellen, I don't know if I could get too much work done if I was trying to watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> that one, that one sucks me in. <laughs> Reruns of Law and Order, I could probably watch while I work. Ah, uh, yes, the news. Although, pretty distracting these days. All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any more burning questions. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, I'm glad these were helpful. And like I said, um, read through your feedback as soon as possible and get any last minute questions you have out to your instructor um, sooner rather than later so you can get that clarification back and um, put the finishing touches on your papers. All right, thanks so much, guys. I'm gonna stop sharing this. And I'm going to give us a couple minutes uh, for our Eco 202 students to get in. I don't want to start too early if some of them plan to be here right at 9. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up the... Well, hang on. I'll pull up the document for now. Now, is anybody here on the line here for 202? Or is everyone here still lingering? from 201. All right, we have one so far. Hi, Steph. <laughs> and Anthony, great. Two Stephanies. <laughs> what are the odds? I, I So thank you guys for uh, bearing with me for a few moments while I give some of your classmates a chance to join if they get here right at nine. I don't want them to think that they were late. We do have um, a few new elements to go over. So that's what we'll be focused on tonight. Hi, Kiara. All right, and just a, a warning while we have a couple minutes, my screen has been acting a little bit funky and it's doing its funky thing again, so if I read something wrong from the wrong place because I can't see what I'm doing well, just uh, please let me know, students or instructors who are here to help me. <laughs> I can see pretty well right now, but it might get worse. I'm, I'm getting it fixed tomorrow, but I didn't want to cancel tonight's webinar just because of that. David, thank you. My vacation was wonderful. Um, I'm very fortunate that my husband is from a tropical country and we can go there and stay with his family and friends for free. <laughs> Just have to get my whole family down there. <laughs> yeah, it was really great. Um, I have to be careful about the sun because I'm pretty fair skinned, but uh, other than that, you know, staying in the shade for most of the day, it was pretty nice. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Actually, I went to San Juan same around the same time, not this year, but um, my husband and I, that was our first, our first trip together. It was awesome. I love San Juan and old San Juan. Yeah, that was a really great trip. I hope you had fun. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we didn't get to do anything that cool. <laughs> I was just at the time, I was very young and I was excited that there was a swim up bar. <laughs> so we, we mostly do that. But yes, yeah, zip lining next time. Next time I go back, I'll do something cool like that. <laughs> All right. Well, it's nine o'clock. Uh, we've had a couple extra people join us. So that's good to see. Um, so welcome, macroeconomic students. Uh, you have a little bit more work to do on your final projects, unlike when you were in micro. Um, because 
We don't cover uh, foreign trade until week six. Uh, these elements are saved until the final project. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't include them in the earlier milestones, which are due um, in week five and earlier. And then, you know, because you're going to be adding some stuff, um, your paper wouldn't be, yeah, I'm sorry, your project, your PowerPoint presentation wouldn't be complete. We also saved the conclusion slides for, um, for this here, for the final project submission. So the first two that you're adding are on foreign trade, like I mentioned. And I just want to show you where they fall in your paper. So if you were to go back and look at the final project, the, the document that explains your final project, what you need to do, it has the rubric and everything, that big long one, um, it, would, it would have all this, all the elements in this order that I show you that we have here on the final project um, template. So the GDP elements come first, and then the unemployment and inflation elements, and then the interest rate elements. And if you look at that document, you'll see that next comes the foreign trade elements. So we didn't include these in the, the big milestone one with the data, like I said, because we didn't cover it until week six. So we couldn't really have you include it then. But it is technically part of that first section that's all about collecting the data and sort of applying some of the theories to the, uh, the raw macroeconomic data that you, that you get in your research. So this first one is about uh, imports and exports, the kind of basics thing that you would look at when you're first looking at foreign trade. So you'll want to get that for, um, for every year of your 10-year time period. Um, some students miss that, not, not just on the foreign trade, on the imports and exports, but on some of the other um, macroeconomic indicators as well. They'll just get it maybe for a few years instead of for each, each year in the 10-year time period. So make sure you've got it for each year. Uh, you can show it as, um, as net exports, uh, as well as imports and exports, or you can just show it as imports and exports. Um, there's, and then you can show it in dollar terms, make sure that you use real inflation adjusted dollars, or you can show them as a percentage of GDP. That one is your call, um, depending on, on how you get the data. We do have some links here to find the data. Uh, some students have had trouble with this link. We, uh, the reason that this link was included was because it goes all the way back to the 50s reliably. Um, so for students who choose the 1950s, but it's all from the Census Bureau. So you can go to the Census Bureau and get the data yourself. Um, it might be not quite as tidy as it is here, but it might work better for you. Um, this, these links are to a site called Trading Economics, which just aggregates some of the data the Census Bureau has. Um, and it also has some, some other data as well, like exchange rates that you might find helpful. Um, because you also are going to have to talk a little bit about the trends you see in the imports and exports. So, for example, you know, we have an example here, a stronger dollar would lead to more imports and also lead to fewer exports because our dollar is worth more, we can buy more of other people's stuff, but it also makes our stuff more expensive because people have to use more of their own currency to buy it our products, so that would lead to fewer exports. So that's one example of something that might uh, move imports and exports that you could talk about. All right, thanks, Ellen, for handling David's question about that. Um, so just like always, uh, before I move on, your the data, of course, um, hopefully presented graphically. I think that works better than if you were to present it in a table. It's easier to see how it's moving steady up, is it kind of flat, up and down, um, if you put it in a line graph. If you have it in a table and people just see the numbers, it's, it's a little bit more difficult for uh, people to see the trend. So ideally you put it in a line graph, um, that would of course be on your slide, and then maybe a couple, a couple bullets of, about what you want to say, some major takeaways, and then the notes are going to have the bigger explanation about what we see in the graph. All right, so then the next foreign trade critical element that you've got to cover um, is relating foreign trade to some of our macroeconomic models. So the one that you use, you've hopefully used a lot already um, is the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model, which does a really good job of relating to our GDP function because base, you know, your aggregate demand curve is basically just a representation of, um, of the GDP formula. 
it includes all those same elements. So the consumption, invest, private investment, government spending, and net exports. So since net exports are, are part of that model, they shift the AD curve and the ADAS model. So that is directly related to, um, to foreign trade in that way. So that, that model is very applicable here. And you can use that model to talk about some things that you see in the data. Um, another model that you could use to talk about either using both or instead of the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model um, is the, the theory of comparative advantage. So if you see trends in um, who we import, who we trade with, and what kinds of things we trade, you could talk about comparative advantage in that way. So perhaps our imports are increasing um, because some of our trade partners have a, a comparative advantage in a lot of the things that we like to buy. So my kids like to point out that everything is made in China. I remember when I was a kid, everything I had was made in Taiwan. Uh, so, you know, those things change and they affect not just overall trade, but the trade patterns that we see. Um, so that's something you could discuss here in terms of comparative advantage. But it is funny how quick they, they catch on that. Mom, why is everything made in China? So I tell them not everything. <laughs> Just the plastic toys that I seem to have too many. So those are the foreign trade models. Before I move on, does anybody have any uh, specific questions about those? looks good. All right, so you'll notice that the fiscal policy stuff comes next. You did that in milestone two. Um, we'll talk a little bit about revisions when we go through the new, after we go through the new stuff, but so this will, will come, so you add in your slides for foreign trade right after the interest rate slide, or slides, and then comes your fiscal policy slides, and then comes your monetary policy slides and then come your conclusion slides. So these are where the very end or the last two new slides come in. So the, the first of these last two slides for your conclusion section, this first one is just called conclusions. So you're gonna sort of give a brief summary of the data, the history and the policy analysis that you've done. Um, so maybe call out a few important data points, you know, maybe some especially bad or good um, years in terms of GDP growth um, or unemployment or inflation or all of those. Um, briefly list some of the major policies that, that happened and any major historical things that took place. So you're just gonna wanna kind of bring all that together in a, in a way that neatly summarizes um, the economics of your decade. So you, know, you can make, you can be creative about it if you want or you can just keep it sim some simple bullet points to summarize what you found um, but don't put too, too much on the slide because, again, it's just supposed to be a brief summary. And then in the notes, a little bit more detail than what you've got on the slide to maybe expand on each of the bullets that you put or if you, you know, you tried to make some sort of, um, you know, neat graphic or chart with different things that you wanted to highlight, you could go into a little bit more detail about each of those things. Um, but you're not really going to be presenting anything new. But do be sure to include some specific examples and data points um, because that is what's going to get you full credit in terms of your, your score when we look at the rubric. So it is included here, but just as a, another refresher. So that was pretty straightforward. You're not, again, you're not, you're not bringing up anything new here, just summarizing stuff that you've already done. And then last one, this is the kind of fun one. Uh, I think it's fun. <laughs> I think it's a fun opportunity for students. Um, is your agree disagree slide. So you spent a lot of time in uh, on this project looking at fiscal and monetary policy um, and how how that's related to theory, how that's related to the data and how it affects you know economic outcomes. Um, how you know data informs these policy decisions, but then it's also impacted by these policy decisions as well. So you're going to take a look at all that stuff that you, that you've researched the various fiscal policies that you researched and the various monetary policies that you've researched, and you're going to give your thoughts on it. Maybe some you agreed with, maybe some you disagreed with, um, and you, this is your chance to explain your reason why um, based on some macroeconomic reasoning. 
Now, maybe your reasoning was, you know, Monday morning quarterback. I disagree with it because it didn't work. <laughs> That's fine. Um, you know, this was supposed to make the economy grow more and it didn't. This was supposed to bring down inflation and it didn't. It was supposed to help unemployment and it didn't or it didn't enough. Um, something like that. You could disagree with the policy because um, you don't think it was the right approach. Maybe a different policy would have been more effective in your um, in your opinion based on some sort of macroeconomic theory or concept that you now know. Or you could say why you agree. You know this works because you know this this is how these um, these things interact. For instance, if we if we use fiscal stimulus, that's going to get people spending more money and that's going to get more people hired because more people are spending more money and this is how it will work and look, it worked. Um, so those are the kinds of reasoning that you could use to agree with something. If you agree or disagree with something, just because you don't think that's a good idea, maybe based on something that doesn't have to do with macroeconomics, like I don't think it, you know, the example we give, I don't think it's fair to give money out to people that that might be a valid reason, but it's not based in macroeconomics. Um, you might have a religious reason that you disagree with something or agree with something or uh, a political reason that you agree or disagree with something. But we really want the arguments here to be have, have some macroeconomic basis to them. So that you can argue it from from that standpoint in some way. And it's definitely possible for two people to look at the same policy and have different feelings about it based on macroeconomics, um, professionals do this all the time. So it's not like you have to put yourself through some mental gymnastics to do this. Uh, people, you know, can use the theory to come to different conclusions and look at how things panned out and see it differently. You might say, you know, this policy was a great success. Look, GDP increased. And someone might look at the same policy and be like, yeah, well, GDP increased, but it only helped this group of people and not this other group of people. So that wasn't really effective or it wasn't effective in the way that it could have been. So that's why I don't agree with it. So there's lots of room for latitude um, and for people to agree and disagree looking at the same policies. So just, you know, think about how you how you feel about what you learned as you uh, as you research those policies and as you looked at the data and thought about how all this stuff interacts when you Look at those um, macroeconomic models, and and you know you, this is your chance to to share just your own thoughts. You don't have to include research here, additional research here. You know the stuff that you've already done um, should be enough to to support what you say, one way or the other. And then the last slide um, is going to be your references. So we've talked about this in other webinars, um, but just make sure this is at the end. Make sure you include everything. Um, so if you have your references split up, okay, these were my references for milestone one, my references for milestone two, just make sure they all get in here. Um, it will be an APA style, even though there's no specific PowerPoint um, style. Just make sure that, you know, it's called your references, it's in alphabetical order, and that the listings themselves are in APA format, um, which, you know, you should be familiar with. Um, and if you're not, we've got lots of great resources in our class and uh, through the wider university, if you have any struggles with that. But otherwise, that's it. That's all the new stuff that I wanted to cover. Any questions about any of the new elements? Usually students do pretty well on this, I will say. Um, the, the only trouble they tend to get into is forgetting to include them. But otherwise, the people tend to do a very nice job on these extra four slides. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop sharing this, and I'm going to open up, um, since we have some time, the rubric and go through that quickly, since um, we are changing rubrics now. Okay, so this is the, the document that I referred to before where you can see the sections um, and where foreign trade elements fit in and the conclusion elements fit in. So you see section one has all the data stuff, the GDP, 
and then all the way through foreign trade. So foreign trade gets tucked in there when you deliver your final submission. And then fiscal policy and monetary policy, and then the conclusion here at the end. Um, so that follows exactly how the template is, is laid out. And then this goes through our milestones. But what I want to focus on is the rubric. So if you'll recall from your milestone submissions, there were three performance levels. There was not evident, if you just totally missed it, needs improvement, um, you didn't quite hit the mark, and proficient, you, you did hit the mark. But well, you'll notice now that we have the exemplary performance level. So now that you have gotten to the end of the course, pretty much, um, we've covered all this material, you've gotten feedback from your instructor, now you can revise these elements and make sure that they can reach this level. So the expectations are just a little bit higher for the final project than they are for the milestones. Um, it makes the milestones hopefully <laughs> a little less intimidating and, and turns them into a formative assessment so that you can work things out, get some feedback from your instructor, and then finalize it, make it a little bit better, uh, polish it up, and be in a better position to reach this exemplary level for here in week seven. So I just want to make sure that you're all aware of this and can go through it and um, feel prepared to wherever, you know, to reach whatever goal you're trying to get in this class. I know not everybody's, nor should everybody aim for perfection, but maybe say, okay, this is, this is where I want to be um, and this is how I think I can get there. So the rubric is your best way to do that. Um, in conjunction with the feedback you've gotten on the milestones from your instructor. So most of these are just going to ask for you to add a little bit more detail to the pro what's expected at the proficient level. So if we go through this, you'll notice that that's kind of a recurring theme um, and also to add research in. So um, one big one that, uh, well, I shouldn't say big one, they're, they're all the same point value, but one easy one to do that a lot of students miss is this last one here on this page it says examination unemployment output and growth so you'll notice that the proficient element um, asks you to analyze unemployment and inflation data during the time frame in relation to the output and growth using macroeconomic principles and models to explain their effect and provides information in the speaker notes. So this is where you, you presented the unemployment and inflation data, and you just talked about how it's related to the overall economy, um, you know, using the stuff about macroeconomic principles that you've learned now. So that's been done. But what you can add to get exemplary is explain how that data is collected and calculated. So there are different um, unemployment uh, rates that are calculated. Um, and there's a specific way that they calculate the unemployment rate, even the traditional one, that a lay person might not really realize, oh, that's how they come up with the unemployment number. Um, so this is, you would explain, okay, this is the unemployment number and this is how they arrive at that number. You know, they, they have to take the number of people who are looking for work but don't have a job, and then that's your numerator, and then your denominator is the labor force. It's not just everybody in the country. And so, you know, this is something you've learned in the class that that's how they get to that number. You know, housewives or um, retired people or students aren't counted when you look at unemployment uh, if they're not looking for a job. So somebody who hasn't taken this course might not know that. So you would include that sort of thing here. And then the same thing for inflation. Um, there's different inflation indices that take a slightly different approach to how they're going to come up with their calculation, like what basket of goods they use, how they weight things. Whichever one you picked, because you could pick different ones, um, you want to explain how that particular index is created. So, you know, that is something you can easily look up and it should be in our textbook. So I would, I would encourage you to just go to use our textbook, but you can also just look it up, you know, through a normal web search. So that's a simple one to add um, to get there. Again, a lot of these are just asking you to add uh, a little bit more detail, some examples, um, and research. Just making sure there's no specific ones that a lot of students tend to miss um, or tend to not get correct on their milestone. 
Um, but Shauna has a question. I think where I have a hard time is when it says to use models. I'm thinking, what models? I know, I know there is the ADAS model, but I'm still not entirely sure what that is. I've just been getting kind of going with it. So, um, Shauna, that's a great question. The aggregate demand, aggregate supply model is, in most of these cases, the most useful one. So that's the one you can use for the fiscal policy and monetary policy sections. Um, and also even the unemployment and inflation one. So that's that's the kind of the, the workhorse of them. But as Ellen says, you can also look at the money market one and that, that will be mostly applicable um, for the interest rate section and the monetary policy section. Um, yep, Phillips curve is another one that you can talk about with unemployment specific to that one. Comparative advantage is gonna be um, come into play mostly for um, the trade section, the foreign trade section, and possibly eh, you might be able to talk about it in, in terms of um, GDP, unemployment, and you know historical events. If there was a major shift in, in trade patterns that affected our GDP and unemployment that were related to comparative advantage. Um, so the, ADA, the ADAS model can apply to so many of these. You know, it's if you've already taken microeconomics, this is the macroeconomic version of the supply and demand model. So the demand here, when we talk about aggregate demand, is just the demand of the whole country. So businesses investing in their firms, they're buying, they're buying new computers, they're buying new factories. That's that's the investment that they're doing. They're they're creating software. Um, people buying stuff for themselves. That's just general consumption. Government spending. Governments building new roads paying police officers um, and net exports. So, you know, we pump oil out of the ground and we export it, or we grow a lot of wheat and then we ship it all over the world. Um, all that stuff is the demand in our, in our whole, as a country as a whole. So when that, most of what we do here is looking at, especially in the policy section, um, the, the fiscal policy and monetary policy is almost always aimed at shifting that demand curve. Um, so if they can, if there can be some sort of impact on consumption or an impact on business investment or an impact on government spending or exports, that's going to move the demand curve. Um, and then if you go back and obviously I can't, it's not very easy for me to show you right here. Um, but if you go back and look at any of the videos from our textbook um, or anything that your instructor shared in your class, you'll see that at the bottom of that graph, um, if you look at the aggregate demand, aggregate supply graph, instead of it just being quantity, like it is in demand and supply for microeconomics, like how many uh, widgets did I sell? It's the output of the whole economy. It's everything that's sold. And the way that this relates to unemployment, and I think a lot of students forget this, is that the more GDP we have, typically, the more employment we have, because to produce the stuff, we have to employ people. So that's kind of a proxy for one another. So when the aggregate demand curve moves outward to the right and it increases GDP in, in the model, in the theory, um, we would expect that unemployment would also increase. Um, I'm sorry, em employment would increase. So unemployment would decrease. We'd have more people employed if we're producing more stuff in our economy. Um, and then on the y-axis is your price level. So instead of the price of a good, it's just the general price level of the economy. So that's where you, where the inflation bit comes into the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. So there you can see it kind of touches on everything in here, which is why we recommend it so much. Um, the other models are important, but they're more specific to specific things. So like Chiara mentioned the Phillips curve, that's specific to the relationship, kind of the trade-off that sometimes exists between unemployment and inflation. Um, the comparative advantage is more specific to foreign trade and the money market is more specific to um, how interest rates work, how people demand money and how money monetary policy works. So obviously that's a lot to take in in one in one sit down, but that's the general gist of it. Um, and if you are unsure of what model to apply in one of these critical elements, or you know you got some feedback you didn't do well on a specific critical element it's telling you it'll apply a model 
you're not sure if you did it right, that's the time to just email your instructor and they can they can walk you through it and have a, a more pointed conversation because I have to talk in generalities a little bit here, but they can get specific with you um, once you narrow it down on a particular issue. I'm glad it helps. Yeah, I mean, I could probably do a whole webinar on aggregates of aggregate demand, aggregates supply model, maybe, maybe someday. <laughs> but there's, you know, there's lots of, of great resources out there above and beyond our textbook. I know in my class, I share, um, I share videos from instructors from other universities and just other people have put great things on YouTube that, you know, make it really easy to share and, um, you know, if, if the explanation from the textbook doesn't help it sink in, then no harm in finding something else that does or, or us as instructors creating something um, that will do the trick. <laughs> statistics is, uh, statistics is tough. I was actually trying to refresh my memory on statistics and going through the course and it's just, it's just so much to remember. You gotta take good notes get ready for the final. <laughs> There's a lot, they cover a lot. But yeah, Khan Academy, Khan Academy is a great one. And, and honestly, just, just YouTube. I mean, you could go to YouTube and just type in um, aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. If it's not, if you're like, hmm, I, I don't really feel like I have a handle on this. And maybe I'm not, ex I'm not applying it right in my, in my project. Um, just watch, watch a couple of the videos. They do, um, who did I find? Oh, I'm, I'm going to forget it now, Ellen and Kiara, but the guy from ACDC Economics, he makes much nicer videos now with somebody else. Because um, his original videos are a little bit yelly. Crash Course, thank you. Yeah, Crash Course Economics. I think that they do a wonderful job. There's our, they're, they're well produced, and I think that they explain the content really well. So that one's highly recommended. I always share that with my students when I teach this class. They help a bit. Well, that's a good start. And then, you know, once you feel like, okay, I understand this, now I have a question about this part of it, um, your instructor can fill in those gaps too. Yes, they are. They can be cute. <laughs> and, and maybe try some other ones if, um, you know, there's still some, some gaps in the understanding. Yeah, you, you never know what, what's going to stick. That's the beauty of the internet, you know? You have all the stuff at your disposal, and everybody's different, and different things work for different people, and instructors will try to find, okay, maybe this will work, and maybe this will work, but, you know, you might not get the magic thing for every student in your class, so students can, can sort of take that leap too and try to find what works for them if if the things their instructor has provided um, aren't hitting the mark. And then always, always, always reach out to your instructor with questions. I think that that's the reason that students like these webinars is because they can ask their questions and then with the, a live dialogue, even though you're not speaking to me, you know, we can go back and forth and, and get you closer, each of you, you know, every student closer to what they need to understand. Um, but if you're watching just a video online, you might not have that opportunity. So, you know, watch those videos, read through those materials, and then start a discussion with your instructor to fill in to fill in the gaps and the blanks that that maybe weren't made clear from whatever you read or watched. Yeah, and Shauna, that's where that's where having a direct conversation with your instructor is best because you can get into those specifics. Like, I'm doing the 1970s. This is the policy I'm looking at. I'm struggling with how to ex explain this policy using the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. Can you help me? And then they can they can help you tackle that right then and there. Well, you know, whether it's over email or you have to jump on a phone call or you guys could Skype, um, that way you can get specific. Because if you watch a video, it's probably not gonna get to the exact thing that you wanna talk about. It'll help you understand the concept in general, but if, it might not answer your exact question.
And those are the kinds of questions we love to answer because then we get to nerd out about our favorite subjects. So we'd rather answer those kinds of questions than, you know, stuff that's just about APA citations. <laughs> we'll answer those questions, but they're not as exciting as econ questions. Maybe the English instructors are really excited about the APA questions. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who gets excited about that. I don't. <laughs> Investopedia. Yeah, that one. Investopedia, I found, is has good nuggets of information, but it's very, very brief. So it doesn't go into a lot of detail about anything, um, is, my, is what my experience has been. I don't know if that's been your experience. So it might be a good jumping off point. But yeah, if you might still feel like, hmm, I didn't quite get enough <laughs> if it's that kind of just base level overview of something. But yeah, they, they have some good resources. Just don't cite that. Don't don't cite Investopedia in your in your project. You can use it to help you understand the concepts. That's wonderful. Anything that that helps you understand what you're doing is great. Um, but for citations, just make sure you go to a more appropriate source, academic source. Yes, yes, Wikipedia. You kind of get in a rabbit hole with that with that stuff. Um, all right, so there's nothing else specific I wanna call out here right now um, on the rubric, just in general to have you review what's in the exemplary column um, and whether it's making sure that you add more specific details, um, whether you're going into uh, making sure you use research to support some of your claims, that's especially in the policy, uh, fiscal and monetary policy sections. Um, or just give you know more explanation of the connection between like the data and uh, the models or the theory like we were talking with Shauna. Um, just make sure you go through that and see, look at your work, look at the rubric descriptors, look at your feedback, and just see looking at all those three things together if there's anything that you can add or that you need to change. All right, well, we are at 9.32 now, so um, I'm happy to take any more questions, but uh, we've covered everything that I plan to cover, and I don't want to keep anybody longer than, um, than I need to. You're so welcome. But yeah, if you, if you come up with any questions um, after we sign off tonight, uh, just